Hey, this is Josh's friend Guy Marley-Karain, and you're listening to Season 1 of My Old Hands. Hello, friends. So, I thought I would start this new show with the person that I believe has the absolute best sounding voice I've ever heard in my life. Maybe besides the guy that plays Thorin in The Hobbit. His might be number one. But I'm actually so jealous of his voice that he's pretty lucky we're 10,000 miles apart right now, or I'd be doing some kind of voodoo trying to steal it. So, today I'm joined by a voice actor, YouTuber, and the founder of Booth Junkie the great Mike Delgadio. So welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining me on this first episode of My Old Hands. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. What a, what a fantastic, what a fantastic introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> and it's self-evident, it's self-evident now, people listening to you, why <laughs> I love your voice so much. So I wanted to start by just putting out there a piece of advice I heard you say randomly in one of your YouTube videos on Booth Junkie that has actually changed the way that I present whether it's doing trivia nights or stand-up comedy or mostly in the podcasting world. And that's we have to try to hit the balance between energy and excitement and slowing down. So when you hear people in day-to-day life or on a recording or in the voiceover world, is speaking too quickly the one thing that you think maybe ruins communication more than anything else? It certainly can be very challenging, especially I think speed has a lot to do with comprehension. And so sometimes if you are speaking fast, you often can be speaking past the other person. That can be just one-on-one. That could be when you're instructing, when you're trying to teach something new. That can be when you're reading somebody else's words as a voice actor or as a narrator. There is a tendency to want to speak fast and sometimes conversational. When you're just talking amongst your, amongst your friends about stuff that you know, speed, we often speak very, very quickly. But when you're speaking for the other person to comprehend, slowing down is often just what is needed, right? It's it, it, yeah. it's so important to, to have your tempo, allow the other person a moment to, to think about what you're saying, to comprehend it, and to internalize it for sure. Yeah, that's excellent. And when I started to slow down, because I'd heard that from yourself and a few other people, and maybe ruins communication is too strong a term, maybe degrades the quality might be a better way to put that. Mm -hmm. I found that I'm a pretty low energy person anyway, that when I started to slow down, when I would listen back to myself or I would just hear myself in conversation, I was like, you're even more low energy to the point where either you're going to fall asleep or they are. It's just a race to who's asleep first. (laughs) So how do we, I know this is really niche just to start out, but how do we not lack energy when we're communicating with people, when we're trying to also slow down? Sure. Part of it is also just using your voice. You can slow down, but you can also whisper and that can feel very low energy. Of course. And that can almost become sonorous, right? Where you're actually helping the other person fall asleep or, or whatever it is <laughs> yeah. to lose their energy. They're, they're still going to feel the energy. So you can speak slowly, but you can speak clearly and you can still speak with energy in your voice so that people just are listening. Think of a, a professor who's trying to reach the back row of a lecture hall. They're still going to project. They're still going to perhaps act with animation, move, you know, gesture with your hands and so forth that can convey energy, even if you're speaking still somewhat slowly. Certainly as a narrator, even though many times when I'm narrating things like e-learning or audiobooks, I'm asked to speak quite slowly because I'm teaching somebody something new. But when I'm doing it, the listeners don't have the benefit of, of seeing me, but you're seeing me and you see that I still gesticulate. I still sit with good posture. Mm. I still move around because I, I believe, and I'm not inventing any new territory here, but I believe that 
we as humans, we can sense what the other person's body movement is. We can sort of in our mind's eye see how the other person is moving, even if all we hear is their voice. I mean, that's one of the keys to voice acting is our job is to convey everything our body is doing using only our voice. And so sometimes gesturing and and feeling energetic, even if you're speaking slowly, can really inform what the other person is hearing, even if they can't see you. That's really amazing. And it actually makes me think, I've had a few comments the last couple of stand-up gigs that I've done that I seem so much more comfortable to these people than maybe what I have in the past. And I haven't really changed much because I work with the mic in the stand. I've started Mm. to do what I always do, and that is talk with my hands. And I try not to do that when I'm recording because I end up hitting everything. (laughs) <laughs> the mic, the mixer, the computer, I'll end up, but it's a battle between me and one of my nieces as to who's the biggest hand talker in the family. And that's all that I've added to my stand-up set, but people are feeling more of the story and the emotion behind the words because I'm not just standing there nervously with my hand shaking at my side. I'm articulating all these big movements with my hands. And it literally yeah. is the only thing that's changed. <laughs> and, and, you know, that body language that can, that can speak, if somebody can see it, certainly that speaks volumes to the audience, as opposed to, you know, you see, sometimes you see stand up comedians and they'll put, you know, two hands and they'll be holding the microphone stand or they'll have one hand on the microphone, one hand on the stand. It's a very closed posture. And that could be for effect in some, in some cases, but it can also, it reduces the amount of energy. That you have, as opposed to somebody maybe who's just walking with the mic in the hand, or if they're if the mic is in the stand, if they are gesticulating, if they are using hand motions, I think it goes a long way, and certainly you have to be using it for the proper effect in your act or whatever it is, but it it can really make make a difference. Yeah, that's awesome, and I guess we'll move on from that because that ten minutes was basically just for me. But (laughs) (laughs) so I wanted to talk about this particular show mostly is going to focus on facing and overcoming creative blocks and maybe how you handle those moments where you don't completely get over those blocks or something really gets in the way and you've got to go around it as opposed to over it or through it. So I wanted to talk about a series of videos, Mike, that you have on the Booth Junkie YouTube channel. And for anyone listening for context, when we mention Booth Junkie, it's an educational and gear review channel that Mike does that maps his own development really in the YouTube space and also gives out really down-to-earth and useful voiceover information. But also for for me as a podcaster, it's been helpful. So you had a series of videos where you moved house, Mm -hmm. and you were in a house living next to a road, which I am. We're right at the end of our peak hour, and I'm right next to a road right now, so that's an issue. You moved (laughs) from a house with a road. You moved to a different house and took your then booth with you, and by booth, guys who are listening, I mean just where Mike recorded a sound-treated space and moved it into a new house. And then you discovered that it wouldn't fit. (laughs) And it was just such a great series of videos, and I'll link those up for people, but it mapped that transition. And we'll talk about it maybe later, how you dealt with that, with building a booth. But you also were kind of, I thought, a little sheepish about your true emotions, about how you felt there, because you maybe weren't quite sure how you wanted to deal with it when you made the videos. So I don't want to talk about what you did. I want to talk about how you felt, like how you really felt in that moment where you went to measure the booth and you're like, the bloody thing won't fit in this house. Yeah. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> it was, that was certainly a challenge. And, you know, that, that closet, that uh, it's called a whisper room. That's the brand name. But it's essentially, you think of, it's a closet that I can pick up and take with me so that I can have a nice consistent sound and I can continue to do the professional job that that people hire me to do. And so when I when I got to this new house, the house that I'm that I'm in now, it turns out that it was off by a couple of centimeters. And I couldn't it, it's not easy to modify the booth and it's certainly not easy to modify the house such that it it would fit where I needed it to fit. And I was really faced with a a, a real conundrum and I thought that I had done the measurements correctly when you go through, you know, at least in America, when you're, when you're going through and you're making a house purchase and I was making it long distance, I had seen this house for all of, you know, 30 or 40 minutes 
mm. before I said, okay, this is the house I'm going to buy. And I eyeballed the room where it was going to be. And I was trying to remember my measurements, not realizing how critical that was going to be. And so it wasn't until I actually moved the thing here and I brought the first wall downstairs to reassemble it. And I, oh no, <laughs> this, t- this doesn't fit. <laughs> oh, what am I, what am I going to do? And it really, it just turned into a, it turned into a problem solving exercise at that point. But I was, I was really in a conundrum. Luckily, my spouse tolerated me assembling that in our, in the middle of our living room, like right in the middle of the living room where it did fit, but it absolutely (laughs) couldn't stay there. It would be too loud. It would be too inconvenient for the whole family. Uh, And so I really had to, I really had to decide what what am i going to do and i have to do, move fast because i was still working every day i don't have this thing is a day that i'm potentially going to lose work so that was that was tough it is a there are a few questions i want to ask about that specific sure. situation mike but just for people that are listening can you just give us a quick summation of the level of work that you were doing but it, it wasn't something you were doing on the side you are a professional voice actor and you also oh, sure. have cl- have clients from what I understand, particularly at the time, and you may still have them that have a very short turnaround. Oh yeah, it's it's extremely common in in voiceover, not me in particular, but just just generally speaking, where if something is for an advertising campaign or or an e learning campaign or a product launch, where you're getting a script and you need to turn it around within hours at times uh, it might be you're going to get the script this morning and they need it back this afternoon it's very luxurious if you've got 72 hours to to turn a script around and you know often if you can't <laughs> the, the part as independent contractors as we all are if you say i can't i'm unable they have to go find another voice actor who can And who are they going to return to? So it's really paramount on us as independent contractors to turn that work around and never say at the last minute, I can't because you potentially will lose them as a client. So it's really it's it's important as just in our line of work that you that you are available, that you can turn it around to the specifications that that they need. So it was really, really critical for my business. Hey, legends, super quick. If you're wondering where you can find any of the things that are mentioned in today's episode, head on over to myoldhands.com and you'll find it all there. Okay, let's jump back into the conversation. So, two things. One, the first conversation you had with your spouse about this whisper room is going to have to live in our lounge room and inconvenience everybody involved for a period of time Mm -hmm. and did that stretch out longer than what you'd agreed on and also with not so much your professional work because that has to happen but what were you thinking in relation to booth junkie at the time was there any blocks there or resistance to that's a side venture hobby i'm an educator but it's not my day-to-day work in the same way that recording maybe for the new york times or whoever you were doing voiceover yeah for is. yeah yeah for sure for sure it, it was it was a challenge because so I, I had to work fast. So I I had to continue with the work, the the regular work, but I, I thought that this would be interesting for my channel. And I don't, you know, part of where I was at that time, I didn't talk a, a lot about my specific business because I didn't think that that was necessarily interesting. And sometimes you're under NDA with clients. So I'm always appre- very apprehensive about speaking about specific clients that I'm working with. So I tried to keep things high level. And also, I know that I'm in a position where just throwing money at a solution isn't necessarily necessarily the, the, the right solution. I certainly called Whisper Room and I said, is there a way that you can make me custom walls that are one inch shorter? And they, at the time, they were they were unable to do it. So I went and I went, okay. Am I going to have to throw money at this? And I started calling other booth manufacturers to see if anybody made one that was, that would fit in my room. I found one company that could do it, but it was going to be extraordinarily expensive and time consuming because they would have to readjust all their templates and so forth. And so that led me to, oh gosh, I'm going to have to do this myself. 
and I say it very, very plainly in the videos where I document this is I'm not a carpenter. Like, non I know carpenter, very non builder. I think he might I have don't, said or I something. Don't, <laughs> yeah, I really don't know that much. I I'm using hand and power tools. It's not my strongest suit. I just use you know I use screwdrivers and I've so I ended up having to build it from scratch. And so I went through and I didn't want it to be wrong. I certainly didn't want to make a bunch of videos where this was going to be wrong. So I really had to think about what I was going to do, how I was going to document it. And I was documenting what I was doing all along with the intention of making a video at the end that said, mm. here's what I did rather than going through episode after episode. Hey, watch me, watch me do this. My channel is not about, it hasn't been about, you know, just trying to get viewers get viewers get viewers build audience that's also i really want to it's also not a diy carpentry channel no certainly so. not at all <laughs> not at all and so i only like to I, I only like to share things where i actually feel like i have something to offer it's i, I wasn't making episodes for the point just for the sake of making episodes uh, and so i went through and i i really had to cogitate a lot and i certainly got wound around the axle and saying i i, I don't know what i'm doing I really have no idea what I'm doing. I've never built a door frame and how does this go and where's this <laughs> going to, how's it going to work? So I, you know, I certainly had my own series of blocks along the way as I was trying to figure out how this was going to work. And then at the end, I lost an SD card's worth of footage anyway. So it didn't matter because the document, <laughs> <laughs> the documents that I was making got lost anyway. <laughs> yeah. That will be one of the videos that I link up like. So sorry, just to circle, okay. just to circle back quickly, yeah. just to that yeah. first conversation with your spouse, if you can talk sure. about it. Maybe when you outlined the timeline that you were hoping to achieve, was that met with I 100% believe you, Michael, was there any level of skepticism there or just hurry up and fix it? <laughs> no, I sir, I think I think there was at first it was, of course, you have to make money. This is your job. We'll put this wherever it needs to go yeah, and we'll live with it. Completely understandable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but please get it out of here. <laughs> I don't want to live with this, you know, because it, there is that there is that thing where a temporary solution if it works, can become a permanent solution. That's, you know, what you, that's you, kind you, of what you, I'm driving at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the, she she was certainly very patient with me, <laughs> but she also was always on me to say, okay, how are we going to solve this? How are we going to fix this? What are you going to do? How are we going to get this out of here? Because it's interrupting. You know, it's it's interrupting. And and certainly I, it wasn't sustainable for me. I, I had my own motivation because it meant nobody could watch television in the house. Nobody could walk by the booth. Because all of that sound would still transmit in. So here I am in my living room where the television is, the one room in the house where this thing can go. And I have to say, the whole time I'm working, you can't watch television. You can't mm -hmm. listen to music. You have to walk on tiptoe in your bare feet. That wasn't going to be sustainable for very long. So I had my own motivation to, to <laughs> get out of there. Yeah, it sounds like it. So was there ever a moment? And I'll talk about a video that I saw the name of back in 2017-ish, I think, when I first discovered the channel. It wasn't long after that that she put up a video called It's Over. And I think for fans of your channel and fans of you <laughs> like me, there was a moment of panic. I'm like, what is going on here? Is the channel yeah. over or is his career yeah, over? Has yeah. he got to get another job? What's <laughs> happening here? And I, <laughs> was there ever a moment where you just thought, oh, gosh, what's going on? <laughs> there, was, there was certainly a moment where I didn't know what was going to happen. And I didn't know if I was going to be able to do this. Uh, it turns out that the the house where I I live, I am close to a train uh, a, a train that goes by, and so all of a sudden I had you know the, the I had the additional factor of a train that goes by that's much louder than I had anticipated. It it was ended up not being ideal, I should say. And so I didn't know: Am I going to be able to continue making videos? This booth that had been my set, that had been my thing that people identified is I can't use it anymore. How am I going? How am I going to do this? And I thought, is this, is it over? It's been a long time since I've thought about that video. So I'm trying to, trying to mentally go yeah. back to where I was at that time. But it was, it was definitely a, a challenging moment to, to make a, a huge purchase and have it not work out like you expect. <laughs> and I think the reason you may have mentioned at the time, and I thought it was really honest of you to say that, was you felt as though, and your voice quality at the time from other recordings that I'd heard was so high that you'd already achieved a very high level of sound that the industry, 
was yeah. looking at as this is the gold standard. And you had no yeah. direction you could go, but either stay the same or get better. There was no chance that you could drop off that standard because you kind of had established a reputation of I deliver high quality stuff. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, I, I had built up a client base that knew and expected a certain level of quality of the of the sound that I was delivering. They had gotten accustomed to it. I was certainly nervous that if I did something new, I would sound different, which meant, you know, some projects that might have been in progress that you can't change the way you sound halfway through a project. And, and so there definitely was a moment of what have I done? How badly have I messed this up and what am I going to do at this point? <laughs> and I didn't know. I didn't know if the channel was going to be. I didn't know if the channel was going to be over at that at that point. Thought it might be. <laughs> okay. Well, that was the feeling that we all had as the audience, and yeah. we're glad that it's not. So, yeah, yeah. as part of that series, you then came back with the video, which was a compilation of all of the little bits of or sorry video that you had. So, yeah, and they yeah. all got compiled together. So, the reason that I started this show, Mike, is that I did have a studio. It was more like a radio type room. There was it was a live room. It was very heavily treated. And when people mm. walked in there for the first time, until they put their headphones on and they felt some level of closeness of their own voice, I guess, or comfort, I should say, with their own voice, people weren't used to walking into a room that had no reflections. Yeah. But it certainly wasn't a booth level of, it wasn't soundproofed or treated to that level. Mm -hmm. But I then had to close that because I was right on the border of two states here in Australia and we had different COVID rules. So people were quite often for the period of six months unable to travel between the two cities that are either side of a river that borders the two uh, states. Okay. So my potential local audience got cut in half basically a month before I opened the studio. Oh. So it ended up just not being – I was it was keeping itself afloat, but it wasn't actually – it wasn't profitable and – I had the opportunity to put it all in a room in the house, which ended up actually sounding even better because I was further away from a major road. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a new unit. I was sharing a house with a friend at that time and his family was growing, so I had to move out. This is the worst sounding room I've ever been in, but I think it's only because I got so used to having a perfect podcasting radio type live sure. room. So now I'm surrounded by curt like a theater curtains everywhere and I've got some sound treatment of all my actual panels are all in storage. Mm. And I thought that maybe after 10 years of doing this I can't have worse sound. Like I've got my own shows and I help people edit shows as a side hustle type of thing and that had established a very high quality of sound for a podcast. Can I keep doing this if my environment's not right? And there was a couple of times where I thought Oh, well, maybe I should just focus on comedy only. Maybe podcasting's in the past for me because can I get over the fact that my audio doesn't sound as good as it did a year ago? And that was real hard. <laughs> yeah. With the road outside and I had to double curtain the window and I don't have a sporting facility close to me or a dog like I think you may have sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's really the genesis of this show was that moment where I thought, oh, this might be it for me. Mm -hmm. And it's really an environmental thing, which is why you're the num the first person on this show, <laughs> because in your line of work, I can't imagine anything would, other than maybe if you're unwell at the time and your voice doesn't sound great, that there's nothing that would hold you back or be more resistant for a voice actor than if you have an environmental issue. This episode was edited by Dead Set Podcasting. If you want your podcast to sound this good, check out deadsetpodcasting.com forward slash services. Get the sound you're chasing. Yeah, it's, I mean, certainly so much of my work depends on that environment. For me, it ended up being, you know, I, I got to continue to feed my family, so I had to solve this somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it meant debt, luckily it didn't mean going into debt, but I was going to have to, I was going to have to solve it. But yeah, you certainly face, you face that conundrum and I'm not sure how it turns out for you, but that adversity actually turned it into my, my channel got stronger. My ability to, to create got stronger. That bit of adversity gave me new confidence after once I got my new booth, it was bigger, sounded just as good. 
I could do whatever I want with it because I built it. It's got its own set of flaws and foibles to it, for sure. I've gotten to know it quite well, but it it has made me it has made me stronger in both my voice work and in my creativity for for YouTube. So it's, it's it ended up helping in the long run. Well, I'm not going to claim that I got over it myself at all. It was actually <laughs> not my shows because I'm so particular that I could hear that they weren't they were 95 and not 97 on my mm. scale sort of thing out of a hundred of sound quality. Mm -hmm. But it was when a client said to me, because I do a few people, there's one that's local. And she came in and she's in the beauty industry and she released a show. And some of the first lots of feedback she had was, this sounds so much better than any other show in this genre. This is amazing. And she shared that feedback with me. And that literally got me over it like that. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so what's going out to the world by my standard may not be ideal. But once you reach a certain level, I guess, as long as you know how to make shift an environment that works, <laughs> mm-hmm. kind yeah. of, you know, fake it a little bit with some curtains instead of treatment or whatever you need to do, the audience may not be as picky as you. And they're probably just happy that you did the thing. And you're probably putting forth, you know, more effort than a lot of people are, or maybe that they know how to do because you've got a, a certain level of expertise that you know that you need to do these things. Yeah. Um, that it doesn't just sound like you're in a bedroom somewhere. And why I guess I bring that up just to slightly change direction, Mike, is that Mm -hmm. you put out a couple of videos at one point where you needed to make a makeshift booth in an Airbnb and I think, again, in a motel or a hotel. Yeah. And that was I don't think that was for a recording. It might have been just for auditioning to get parts, but those were the type of videos where it's very inspiring to – for the lack of a better term, that, oh, this guy that's got this incredible sound, he quite often has to find a way. Yeah. The booth is not always accessible when he's away or traveling or whatever. Yeah. And I thought, I actually, I did that that, that little series. I have this, um, this playlist, I suppose, of called Improvised Vocal Booths. And I did it for, I did it for two reasons. One was to make sure that I knew what to do. I never wanted to be faced with a situation where I needed to record something and the environment was going to hold me back. I always wanted to have the best possible sound I could because it's, you know, part of, I stake my reputation on that kind of thing. So I always wanted to be able to, that even if it's just an audition, I want it to sound as close to my studio as I could possibly get it. So the only way you do that is, is you actually have to practice in my case, making that sound acoustically treated environment using materials that you have on hand. But the, the, after I did the first one, it became partly to show that even in cases where you don't have much at hand in a hotel room, you've got very little at hand and they're usually terrible, terrible from an acoustics perspective that if you think about what you're doing and you learn about some of the principles that are important to this, that you actually can do this. So if you are interested in voiceover and all you have is, you know, your bedroom, can you make a, a recording studio with zero dollars? Yeah, you probably can, assuming you have a microphone, of course. But if you've got, you know, couch cushions and you've got blankets and pillows and you can move your furniture around, I, I think in some hotel rooms, I stood the mattresses on their side. You know, I was doing whatever I possibly could to try and get that sound. And I still had to put it back before I checked out. So I could do nothing. I could do nothing permanent. It had to be all improvised. And in many cases, I could create a good quality sound, good enough that I felt comfortable auditioning with it for sure. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And I think it's the juxtaposition between doing that little bit of effort and experimenting and refining. If I get stuck, this is how I'm going to try to get it across the line versus a lot of musicians and podcasters and stand-ups and maybe video creators as well, particularly people that are making short form sort of stuff where they've got to churn out a lot of it. I know a lot of people that probably, how can I say this? If I can't have the perfect environment, I'm not going to start. Yeah. And I think that's maybe one of the big blocks now that I come across with people is, and from experiencing that myself when I moved in here, I'm probably more attuned to it when I hear that kind of language from people. Uh, I'll do that when I have the right space. I'll start that when I get the right camera. There's so much around the gear and the environment that stops people from not even starting stuff. 
I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but it just makes me think of that. No, it's you're absolutely right. I mean, it's I think there's a fear of looking bad, being embarrassed yeah. by something. But certainly I go back and I look through my my first videos. I was terrible at lighting. I still am not particularly good at lighting. I'm terrible with a camera. It's not my not my strong suit at all. I don't know. Uh, certainly then I didn't know from white balance. I didn't know from fo- I just had the a three hundred dollar point and shoot camera that and I literally didn't know anything, but I didn't let that prevent me from trying to create something. Mm. And what I found is people are very tolerant. If you're coming from a genuine place, if you're teaching with, uh, certainly my case, if from a teaching perspective, I'm teaching with honesty and trying to, trying to impart some nugget of wisdom that I have learned o- over time that people will look past if it's slightly blurry or if it's not in 4K. People will will embrace what you're doing and you can't let what is it you can't let perfect be the enemy of good enough what's i don't even know what that phrase is we you know the phrase i'm talking about i do yeah (laughs) i get it i always get it messed up in my head (laughs) don't let perfect be the enemy of the good don't let think yeah or something like that yeah right and so you don't have to it there is that uh, i'll wait until i can afford the camera until i can record in 4k i'll wait until i can buy the studio lights i'll wait until i can do this or that or this other the other thing but if you don't actually start to do the work, you'll never get there. If you want to, I use this analogy for, for other things, but if you want to, if you want to be a musician who performs on stage, you're still going to have to mess up your scales in rehearsal in in practice. And you're still going to have to rehearse and you're going to have to forget your lines and forget the melodies before you can work up enough experience that you can be comfortable on stage, knowing that, if something happens, I can re- re- can recover from it, and that's that's part of the experience that we get paying those dues, I suppose. I cut a little bit of a podcast I did in twenty seventeen into another show recently to show how I did something at the time, mm. and I thought I was okay at the medium, speaking into a microphone and presenting, you know, a story or a joke or a message. And I almost put myself to sleep. I end up cutting like way shorter because I'm like, this guy is the most boring person I've ever listened to, <laughs> but it was me. And I'm like, yeah. okay, I, di- I didn't realize because I'd already been doing it for six years at that point that in the interim, another five years later, I'm X amount better again. Maybe I wasn't improving like I was over the first period, but I've still been improving. And it was really noticeable when I cut my current audio and then went to that audio. It kind of, and I'll describe what I'm doing here, it was kind of like, you know, when you you do the downward thing with your head, like off a cliff. Yeah, it was probably worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> it, was pr- it was pretty bad. So you would mentioned in there about the 4K stuff and all of those things. And that was actually a question I was going to ask you, Mike, but you've kind of covered off on it already, the advice that you would give to people. If we could just sum that up, voiceover or anything else creative. And I do have some listener questions that I picked up that I want to ask you before we go. But what advice would you give to someone that maybe is right in the middle of a creative block? They don't have to be voiceover, just anyone that's facing a bit of resistance. There's probably two, two things, and this this may sound, this will sound totally contradictory, but there are there are two things that I've had whenever, whenever I encounter a block. There's continue to make something and then walk away from it. And this was instrumental for me when I was... I was trying to learn how to play drums and I started in my forties and I, and I practiced drums for five years. I wanted to learn, you know, get to get a, a basic level of drumming. And so what I found is I would practice and I would practice and I would practice and I would get stuck. I would get stuck trying to learn a rudiment, you know, some pattern. Cause with your 40 year old, your old brain, it's much harder to learn those patterns. And I would get so mad and so frustrated and I would, and I would practice and it would continue to fail. And those are moments where you feel like, oh, I've got to give up. I'm never going to be good at this. It's never going to work. Yeah. So you practice. But what I have learned is that your brain doesn't actually shut off. If you walk away from it, your brain will continue to cogitate and say, what did I do? And it will start to sort that information. It will put it into the proper bins and filing cabinets that are up in your brain. However, those neurons fire and those synapses fire that coming back to it, then having had that 
benefit of, of gnashing through and failing often will lead to a breakthrough on the other side. So you, ha- you still have to put in some effort. You got to try and you got to fail. It's got to not work so that when you go to sleep that night and you wake up the next morning, your brain has continued to work on it. If you literally just give up, if you, if you practice for two minutes and go, well, this is too hard. I'm just never going to get it. I'm going to walk away and I'm going to go have a bowl of ice cream. That is not going to solve the problem. You got to try mm. and you got to be willing to put in some work, but then you have to acknowledge that I'm not going to get it right now. And you got to try something else. I've done that with making my, with videos. I've done that with auditioning. I've done it with something that I'm trying to learn when I'm, you know, if I'm trying to learn JavaScript or something like that, something that I'm not, or, you know, learning an instrument, anybody who's practiced something, they know they, they come up against that wall and you got to walk away. You got to freshen your brain up with something else. I just can't grind and grind and grind until it's perfect. It doesn't work for me that way. And I think, I, I think that's, it's common for, for other people. You got to walk away for a while. And so that could be walking away for a couple of days. That could be walking away for a week. But as long as you continue to cogitate on it and think about it and have a desire for that thing to come true, your brain will continue to serve you towards that purpose. And when you come back to it, you may find that the solution that you had been searching for is right there. And that will lead to the next thing that you get stuck on. And hopefully you're 1% better at it than you were before. (laughs) And you'll get stuck on the next thing. I mean, this is how you become a virtuoso instrument player. This is how you become a professional at anything is you, you practice, you fail, you cogitate, you succeed, then you fail on the next harder thing and you cogitate on it and you practice and succeed. It's that, it's that repetition that gives you the experience to know what to do next and your brain will help you figure out what the next thing is to do but you got to you got to sort of thrash around on it for a while at least that's how it works for me (laughs) that is bloody brilliant yeah yeah that's amazing thank you for that so if it's okay mike i just wanted to finish up with two listener questions sure sure so these came to me via dm so the first one is You obviously didn't always have the voice. You didn't drop onto the ground as a two-year-old with the voice. So (laughs) if you weren't a voice actor, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Like what did you grow up thinking the future had in store for Mike? Oh, my goodness. Certainly certainly the dreams that I had, this was not – I've always liked speaking into a microphone. The thing I really like to do is to teach. I never had desires to be like a high school teacher or an elementary school teacher, but I've always liked teaching, teaching what I know and teaching somebody else that thing. So probably I would be doing something in the training world if I, if I had to guess, because it's something I've always enjoyed. I had a, a, a long and productive professional career. I was in management. I managed people. I really enjoyed doing that. So it wouldn't surprise me if I would, you know, be in middle management somewhere uh, that wouldn't actually surprise, surprise me, but it, it is, I was a programmer for many years. I was, a, uh, I learned web development and all those things. I really, really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed being in the flow state of, uh, once you gain your, your professional chops, you've got your 10,000 hours in when you, when you develop that flow state, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about, where all of a sudden you're working on something and hours and hours go by and you didn't even notice it because you're really enjoying just exercising your, exercising your knowledge. I could see myself still be being a programmer if, if I wanted to, but really I would still probably be standing in front of people, teaching them something that I enjoyed because I just, I love it. I've always, always loved doing that. Excellent. That's great. I actually kind of have that same teaching thing. I've got a little show about podcasting that's kind of just free information to help people learn things. And yeah. I think I probably would have ended up a teacher if I didn't have two brothers that were teachers and both of them <laughs> didn't both of them didn't like it. And I, I idolized them beyond belief. So I just figured if they don't like it, that's not for me. Yeah. So <laughs> the last listener question. What was your first job in the VO space where the reaction from the person or the client was, you've got this, you've won the job, 
this is yours. You've got what it takes. It was- You don't have to name a client, maybe just no, no, describe it. It, yeah. it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a client. I've, t- I've told this story. I think I've told this story before. It wasn't a client. It happened twice to me, once to myself and once to somebody else. So the, I accidentally started getting into voice acting. <laughs> I I had moved to sorry, a new sorry, city. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Surely people were telling you with your natural voice that you were made for it. Oh, sure. I'm, I've I've yeah. always heard you, you've got a yeah. you've got a great voice. You should be in radio. And I I I dabbled with the idea of going into radio, and I was I was really put off put off by the dues I would have to pay. I wasn't I really wasn't yeah. interested in in doing radio because I I didn't think I had the chops to become like the morning DJ that made the lot of money that I would just be the guy spinning records at 2 a.m. and probably be miserable. So radio sort of went by the wayside. Yeah, that went by the wayside. So I I moved to a new city and I wanted to meet some new people. And one of the things I always do is I like to take classes. I'm I'm always taking classes. And so I got to this new city and I was like, I'll I'll just go to a, you know, a college and I'll try and meet some other adults and I'll learn photography. I'll learn, you know, how to do film photography or something like that. And the school that I went to, they had a class called the art and business of voiceover. I said, well, people have always said, you've got a a voice for radio. Why don't you go do that? That sounds like it could be interesting. I I always, uh, I I always sort of idolized the guys who had the great big announcer voices. I kind of liked that because I thought of myself as having that great big announcer voice when it was cool. Uh, And so I took that, I took that class and the very, very first night they had us read in it. They had us go into the vocal booth. They had us read. And then they went back and they played what we recorded over the big studio monitors sitting in the big studio space. And when I heard myself and they had it all EQ'd, so my voice sounded really (laughs) just amazing. And I said, I'm home. This is the greatest thing I've, I, that's me. How could that be me? That sounds amazing. Normally people hate the way they sound when they record. I loved the way I sounded. I got to do this. I got to do this. So if that was my first like bit of validation, I wasn't embarrassed by how I sounded, but I also wasn't embarrassed by how I performed. I was not great, but I wasn't embarrassed by it. So I thought, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And, And I bought a microphone like the next day, that night, whatever it was. And I've, I've recorded every day since. I've literally, there's probably 1% of the days in that time that I haven't recorded. <laughs> At the end of that class, they had a, a mentor come to come talk to us about what it would mean to transition to being professional. And she, there was some coaching and we could go to, we could go to work out and practice some more. And so we met at a studio uh, not too long after that class ended and we were working out in the studio and we were just practicing, practicing. And it was near her agent. Her agent came by the studio to sign that she had to get a release for something that she had been working on. And the agent heard me in the booth. He listened. He listened to me. And I had been doing voiceover for 14 weeks at this point. And uh, he says, do you have an agent? I said, no. He says, do you want an agent? <laughs> and he signed me. He signed me yeah. like right, right then. And I was like, I, this, I don't even know what that means. I didn't know what it meant, but it was, it was certainly validating at that moment that whatever, whatever commercial I was working on, whatever fake commercial I was working on, the agent said, I believe in you enough that I would, I would be happy to put you up for audition. So that was, that was hugely motivational for me. I knew I had a long way to practice this. I still have a long, long way to go. We're never done. We're never done. I still have a long way to go. But that was that was like my first real validation. I just remember him walking in. I couldn't hear him, but they were just pointing at me through the through the soundproof booth. And that was that was a big deal for me. That was a big deal. That's huge. And I have two quick ones of my own that are yeah, maybe yeah, not quite yeah. as serious as what we've talked about. Have you ever been asked to do a silly voice or accent and gone away and worked on it? And either had to do it or, or not do it in the end. But have you ever been asked to do an accent that's well outside, or just a s- silly voice that's well outside your skill set at the time? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly I've you know I've done a, a couple of little video games. It's not my it's not animation of video games. Not where I not where I put my effort. But I've done a couple of little ones where they had me go really outside my outside my comfort zone. And sometimes I nail it, and sometimes I really don't. I've I'm not super well practiced at accents, so I'm making them up. And if they don't know. Like what a American from the South sounds like, or an American from Brooklyn sounds like all the classic, you know, ones I can, I can sort of do a fake version of those, but I never pass for a real Brooklyn person or somebody from Georgia or anything, anything like that. So sometimes it works. 
Sometimes I miss it by a mile, just like everybody. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you. I'm sure you learn things from each of those. So yeah. So yeah. the last question for today, sure. Mike, and thank sure. you. You've been really generous with your time. Is I just wanted to describe to you who my favorite audio book narrator is, and a little weird situation with that. My favorite fantasy book is The Elf Stones of Shannara by Terry Brooks. And if people aren't familiar with that, he was the man that created the source material behind the Shannara Chronicles, is what people call it, on Netflix. It was a show about three or four years ago. Okay. And there was a guy named Scott Brick did the Elfstones of Shannara, and it was so different to how I had imagined it in my head because I was expecting maybe more the types of people that had done the Tolkien stuff and the big, slow, heavy delivery, maybe... A British accent as opposed to North American. But I can't imagine anyone but Scott Brick occupying those characters. It would make no sense to my brain now. He dived into those characters at a level that was really extraordinary. And it, after a couple of hours of getting used to his delivery and his tone and how he morphed voices and accents, just that little bit for each character, it really is the pinnacle of an audio book to me in terms of one person being definitive. I was just wondering if, if you have an audio book or a performer that you think is definitive. I mean, Scott Brick is is brilliant. I mean, he's a brilliant actor. And, yeah. you know, what, what he can do with his voice as far as making you believe all those different characters, knowing exactly what those characters are doing, how they're motivated when all you're hearing, all you're hearing is his voice. He's brilliant. There's a couple, couple that are like that, that, that I like and some of them, I, it was unexpected. I really like well, that. Ray that Porter. was unexpected for me. Yeah, like yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, especially when at, at the very first, when you first hear that voice, you go, "Well, that's wrong. That's not who that's supposed to be. That's not what I had it. That's not how I heard it in my head." Sure, the narrator, voice actor that did that for me is, is a guy named Grover Gardner, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my favorite books growing up was Stephen King's The Stand. If you've ever read The Stand, yeah, and it's a uh, Talk about a marathon. I think the audiobook is something like 40 hours. I mean, just <laughs> an enormous, enormous project. And the narrator, Grover Gardner, was not at all what I expected. And if you go listen to the sample on Audible, you'd see it. He's got a, he's got a very interesting voice, not the voice that you would go, he's the voice of God or anything like that. But by the end of that book, I was so attached to all of those characters that I felt like I would miss them. Oh, because wow. it was it was just so perfect. Ray Porter does the same thing. Scott Brick does the same thing. Jim Dale yeah. does the same thing. I mean, there's so many. And I, I'm speaking of male voice actors because I listen to a lot of male voice actors for my own inspiration. So these are 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 people that mean something to me. But I really, I mean, they they inspire me. And I listen to those books. I listen to as many narrators I, as I can because I'm just so in awe of them. Yeah. I, sometimes I have a hard time thinking, am I one of those ranks? Because I'm not a, I'm not a fiction narrator. I'm, I'm, it's not that's not kind of where I put my effort. And so listening to the to the guys and gals who can do that, it's it is inspirational beyond anything because they're amazing. They're amazing what they can do. I agree. Thank you, Mike. The only person out there whose name contains something that they're brilliant at. I think that's great. Del Gordio. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been good if there was a hyphen in there. I know, Del right? Del hyphen audio. So boothjunkie.com. I think that, does that direct still to your YouTube or does that go to the website now? Uh, it, it'll go to my website, yep. but there's a link on the website that will take you to, to YouTube. If you just Google Booth Junkie, you'll end up in all things related to me for sure. And I will include the links to the series of It's Over it's not over, <laughs> and I built a new booth because that's super interesting, and it's almost like background. There's Brooklyn Nine-Nine, your YouTube channel, <laughs> and a Canadian show called Republic of Doyle. They're the three that I put on when I just want to have something on in the background, and I'll just tune in and out when something piques my interest. But, yeah, it's almost it's almost comfort YouTube, Mike. Uh, so thank you for that. Thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really it's incredibly flattering. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this. such kind words. Thank you. And thank you for being the first guest on My Old Hands. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Happy to be here.